right, guys, welcome back. Episode 10, Time Flies, Time Flies. This is a monumental episode for us because it's our 10th one, 10th week. So first of all, we want to thank you guys. Our growth has been tremendous um, on all audio platforms, on YouTube, on Instagram, Mm -hmm. 10 weeks in, and you know we're hitting the ground running. So that's only because you guys are spreading the word. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks to everybody who's been supporting, um, hitting our website up, getting the merch. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. So we're going to jump into it this week with one of the biggest topics of discussion, which is a massive college cheating scandal, uh, college admissions cheating scandal, and it reaches pretty broad reaching. Uh, it's the biggest one in American history. Yeah. From an FBI probe. So I put it on my Instagram. I put it on our Instagram, actually, on your leisure page to see, yeah. you know, the reaction, if we should talk about it or not. And a lot of people wanted us to talk about it. And a lot of people really wasn't sure exactly the what, full dynamics yeah, of it what as happened far as, here? like, what it really encountered and, you know, all of that stuff. So with that being said, we want to jump into it and explain it in full. Yeah. Because... It's more involved than what people think. Yeah, a lot of people are like completely, completely oblivious to what happened. They saw it on the news and the headlines, but there's so many layers to it. And hopefully we'll, we'll be able to explain that to you in a way that you can understand and digest. All right. So you want to start it off? Yeah. So we'll start with um, by the FBI finding this out by mistake, completely by mistake. It was just a happenstance. They were investigating this, this man named uh, Maury Tobin, who was a Yale alum, and he was under investigation for a pump and dump scheme. So a pump and dump is when you put money into a stock and the stock rises and you sell it because you you know that the stock's not going to last long. So he was under investigation. They had all the evidence presented for him. And when they presented it with him, he was like, you know what? I'll cooperate, you guys. If you give me leniency, I'll cooperate. So what he does is say, you know what? I'm a Yale alum. My daughter wants to go to Yale and play soccer. Their coach there, Rudy uh, Meredith, Offered me to have my have my daughter come to the school for four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So he says, you know what? If you pay four hundred and fifty thousand, your daughter could come to the school. FBI says, okay, that that's really good. Can you get that on tape? So what Tobin does is he wears a wire and he goes to have the meeting with Meredith and he has him on tape saying it. Now once Meredith is caught, he says, you know what? I'll cooperate if you give me leniency. I'll tell you where the money is going. And it comes up to this man named Rick Singer. And if you don't know Rick Singer, we're going to go into some depth about who, who he is and his role in this story. But um, what he does is he starts singing, ironically enough. So you want to talk about who Rick Singer is a little bit? Yeah. So Rick Singer is a guy. He started a company called The Key, right? And The Key was a company that designed to have affluent parents pay to get their kids into college, yeah. right? And it's a couple of different ways how he went about doing it, but they were all pretty much illegal ways. Yeah. So, right? so the key, it's all unfolded because of Lori Lachlan. Well, Lori Lachlan, yeah. So, so Aunt Lori Becky Lachlan, from yeah, Four House. So she's Aunt Becky from Four House. Yeah. Four House. That, that brings back memories. <laughs> That's 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 a legend. Uncle Jesse's wife. Yeah, Four House. It's crazy. <laughs> so all right. So now you have Aunt Becky from Four House, right? And when he got put the pressure on as far as Rick Singer, he starts to fold. Yeah, so it's to- like a, it's like a domino effect, yeah. right? One guy rats, another guy rats. So now he says, okay, well I'll open it up for you, right? This is bigger than just me. Yeah. So now you have all these Hollywood A list celebrities, B list celebrities that are paying up to five hundred thousand. In some cases, I heard even a million and a half. Yeah. To get their kids into college, right? Yeah. So how they getting their kids into college is the interesting part. Because a lot of times people say, okay, well rich people paying to get their kids into school that's nothing. That's, new. Yeah, we've seen that and before. Who really cares? But this is how it all breaks down because the theme of this show. Is like the backstory behind sports and entertainment, right? Mm-hmm. So we want to give you the backstory behind sports and entertainment. So this all ties in. It's a very complicated situation. So they're really using two avenues to get the kids into college, right? right. So they're paying. They're using disability, learning disabilities, yeah. right? Because now if you have a learning disability, when you take your SAT or ACT, you get longer time yeah so so that comes from him first paying school psychologists so first thing he gets on the payroll school psychologists in the two ways that they do it first one is act sat test 
So he gets school psychologists because he knows that they can create the paperwork that he needs to show that the kids have learning disabilities. So when they get that paperwork, it'll allow them to have extended time. So that's an attesting accommodation, either time and a half or double time. Once they get that, now the kids have longer times to take the SAT. But it goes even deeper because after they take the test, right, sometimes he has another person on the payroll, the proctor of the test. So they take the test, and a lot of times the kids didn't know this, but the proctor was like some guy that they hired, like a SAT genius, and he would just change the answers for the students so that they would get higher scores. He went even further than that, though. Right? This is like one of the illest things he did. We know like when we take the ACT and SAT like way back when, that those tests were at specific locations. So what he did is he knew that the parents had a lot of money, and he said, I need a, a different type of testing accommodation. I need the, the students um, to create a scenario where they have to leave. So parents would say, look, I'm going on a business trip. I'm ha I have to take my children. Is there any way that they can take this in a different location? And they went to two places. They went to Houston and they went to West Hollywood. And when they were there, when they got there, obviously it was the proctor was on the, on the payroll, but sometimes they had people just go into those locations and take it for them. So like these kids never took, some kids never took the test. Some took it and answers were changed. And it's like, wait, what? How did this happen? Yeah. So that's the academic side. All right. And now we're talking about the athletic side, right? So that it's actually fitting that you spoke about the academic side because you work in school. Right. You're an educator, right? And I played sports my whole life. So now I'll talk about the academic side. So this, this, as a Division One, former Division One athlete, I can speak about this firsthand. Yeah. So when you are recruited to go to school... Now, each college has academic requirements, right? Now, the academic requirements, most of the time, they have leniency for athletics, mm -hmm. for athletes, right? So, it's lower for an athlete to get it. The academic requirements are lower, right? Because they're an athlete. Mm -hmm. So, what happens is that you have big-time college sports, basketball, football. Everybody knows that, right? But there's a lot of college sports where we actually spoke about a few episodes ago, and Nobody really knows most of those sports, yeah, right? They're not so you have teams like water polo, sailing, even soccer in some some cases. Squash, squash. Uh, nobody knows. No disrespect to these these teams, but nobody knows the players, and it's not it's it's, it's no big deal, right? So yeah. what happens is that the players on these teams they have a way to get into college with lower. SAT scores, lower ACT scores, lower, you know, academic requirements. So mm -hmm. what they were doing is that now they were paying off the coaches, right? They paid the, co the college coaches to put the kids on the team mm -hmm. so they can get in on that avenue as well. Right. So now the kid is on the squash team and he's never even played squash. Probably doesn't life. even know what it is. Nope. And so they, so a couple of schools got – USC was one of the schools, right? right? So USC, if a running back doesn't show up to practice, everybody's going to know <laughs> that the running back – like that's, you know – Pretty obvious. It's a big deal. Yeah. Nobody's checking to see if the rowing team shows up Captain, to practice yeah. or not, right? So now they have, and they was actually even photoshopping kids' faces yeah. on pictures to make them seem like they were actually real athletes, right? Yeah. So how does this all tie in? And so there's always a plot twist, right? So how does this all tie into everyday people? Is because as we spoke about before, there's two sports that really fund the majority of every sport, all the sports in college, right? Mm -hmm. And those two sports are basketball and football, right? So now you have basketball and football, and we all know the demographics most of the time of those sports, right? Right, right. And those kids most of the time aren't coming from very affluent families. Some do, but most don't, right? Middle class, low class, poor families. So now you have those those two programs are funding the other programs, like water, polo, squash, sailing, all those teams, right? Mm -hmm. So now the funds that they're getting, and it's helping them run their, their programs – the wealthy parents are paying those coaches to let their kids on the team, <laughs> even though those kids aren't actually on the team, yeah. just to get into college. Right. Right? So it all ties into the idea of America and the weird combination of sports and education. It's yeah. not normal to have sports and education tied together in any part of the world other than America. Mm -hmm. Right? So part of the cheating scandal also was IMG Academy in Florida. You know that school. Yes. <laughs> so I am alumni of IMG Academy. So if anybody's not familiar, I'll give you the quick rundown. IMG Academy is one of the top prep schools in America, if not the top prep school in America. And they have a different approach, whereas they build 
the academics around the sports, mm-hmm. right? So sports is your main focus. You go to school for whatever sport you're playing. And then they kind of tailor make your athletic, your academic requirements around your sport. So you train for most of the day and then you go to school for like part time almost. Right. Yeah. So it's a unique situation. So they had the head of academic uh, enrollment for colleges or something. He had a title, something like that. Long story short, he was taking tests for kids to get them into college. Right. Right. At, at IMG. So now it all comes down to. This is a billion dollar business, as we said before, the NCAA and college sports, right? So now college sports is all being tied in with wealthy parents paying for their kids to go to college and they're using it on the back of athletics to get their kids in via 100,000, 500,000, yeah. $700,000 that's yeah. going to coaches. So now everybody's getting paid in this whole situation. Except. Except for the athletes, <laughs> yeah. that's making all this possible. Yeah. The tennis coach at uh, Texas, right, University of Texas, ninety thousand. He's a tennis coach. He got ninety thousand for a kid to get into the school. Who's ever watched a tennis match from Texas? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So it's 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 a very it's a very complicated. Yeah, it, I mean, it reeks of elitism um, it, and privilege. But the the question like that I had was the, like the why? Why are they even doing this, right? Because if you think about it, when you have families who come from affluent neighborhoods and they come from wealth, the college is kind of not even a necessity, right? You've already accumulated your family has already accumulated wealth. Going to college won't guarantee that you accumulate any more wealth, right? If you have five hundred thousand dollars to pay the coach, then why are you going to college, right? Or you could be learning a skill doing something else, whereas Every time a kid like that gets in, you have a kid who's busted their tail throughout their entire scholastic career to have the opportunity, and now they don't. You know what I'm saying? So it's like when a middle class or people from low socioeconomic environments, when they go to college, it's like that's our ticket to middle class. Like we have to go to college because it'll give us a good job and we can live a middle class, quote unquote, life. And it's like, all right, well, college is the key. Well, you already have that. So like what's the why is like kind of puzzling to me. And also... I mean, we talked about basketball and football funding these these programs, but what about the kids that's actually trying to get into college via squash? Or right. Rowing? Like, it's like, taking a spot from another kid right. to get in because yeah. you got a kid on the team that's not even on the team. Yeah, they didn't release the kids' names, but, like, the one of the, the students at USC, when he went to a, the admissions office, they were like, oh, they looked at his transcript and said, oh, you, oh you're on the, you run track. And he was like... What? I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. So sometimes the kids didn't know. In fact, in Wake Forest, one of the students who's in the investigation, they allowed her to stay at the school because they found no evidence that she knew that her parents had paid for her to, to be there. So it's like crazy because like, how do you, what do you do? How do you reverse that? Because String, Sting, Singer's been doing it for 25 years. He's has 800 clients. He's made 25 million off of this scheme. What do you, do you revoke those degrees to the kids who, who got paid? Right? How do you do it? And this is something, like I said, that the average person isn't even thinking about, right? And it just shows you the disparity in this country, in the world too, but especially in this country between the haves and the have nots, right. right? This is something that, you know, the average middle class, poor family, they're not even thinking about anything. They don't even, they're not even aware of this stuff, right? Yeah. So the, the extent that people will go to have their kids succeed, or sometimes, like you said, just to even be a status symbol. Right. It, it's obvious that it's not a, a fair playing field. Yeah, like that said, like, like like what you said, the status symbol. Like my kid is in Yale, or my kid went to Harvard, or he got into USC. It's like really like this kid. There's kids who are really actually trying to get that done. We actually had a case um, in Ohio in 2011. This this young this woman named uh, Kelly Williams Bowler, and she came back up in the news because of this this scandal where she was facing five years in prison because of an address fraud. She lived in a, in a part of Ohio where, you know, poor neighborhood. And she wanted her daughters to have a better life or a better education. So she used her father's address, which was in a affluent white neighborhood. And the school district brought her up on charges for fraud. She was facing five years in prison just yeah. because she just thought, hey, a zoning issue. All right. I want to give my kids the best education. Now, she didn't go to prison for five years. I think she did 10 days. But even 10 days. Like, let's see how many of these these parents actually go to jail. Well, we'll see. We'll see. So, yeah, there you have it. There you have it. America.
<laughs> All right, so now we're going to go into a very hot topic. Another thing that we put on Instagram to see the reaction, and that is, is brick and mortar dead. Yeah. Right? So this is something that we try to talk about things that everybody can relate to. Yeah. And obviously, everybody can relate to brick and mortar, whether you're a customer or a business owner, right? Because most businesses are brick and mortar businesses. Now, well, starting to change, but traditionally, most small businesses are brick and mortar. And everybody, you know, shops in brick and mortar at some point. You know, at any time. So we're going to talk about is brick and mortar dead, right? So the post that I actually put on, on Instagram, it, it had pay less closing mm-hmm. locations. It had Macy's clothing location, Kmart clothing location, Sears clothing location, yeah. um, Radio Shack's closed, Toys R Us closed. Yeah. And then it had Uber, which is the biggest transportation company in the world, has no physical cars, mm-hmm. right? Netflix, which is the biggest movie company in the world, has no movie theaters, mm-hmm. And Airbnb, which is the biggest hotel company in the world, has no physical hotels. Right. So, is brick and mortar dead and everything transitioning to online virtually? Yeah. Uh, we know that 51% of all shopping is done online mm-hmm. right now. So, it's an interesting discussion yeah. to see, is it dead or is it just transitioning? Yeah, I think in 2017, the United States had about 8,700 stores closed and that was like an all-time high. And we're in March, and we already have over 5,000 store closings already in 2019. So this is probably a record year for that. So is it dead? I don't know. Uh, is it adjusting? That's a better question. And I think we have some cases where we might see that it is adjusting. Yeah. So, all right. So brick and mortar, right? In my opinion, we'll just jump right into it. Is it dead? No. I don't think it's dead. Right. I think that the old way of doing business is dead. Yeah. Right. And those stores, Macy's and Kmart and Sears, the reason why they're dead or they're dying is that they haven't adjusted. Right. Yeah. But if you look at like Amazon, for instance, right? Mm-hmm. So Amazon is interesting because Amazon is actually obviously the giant of the virtual world, mm-hmm. right? And we talk about Amazon a lot. Amazon and Jay-Z probably get mentioned in every episode <laughs> because it's just unavoidable. Yeah, no, it's unavoidable. Yeah. But so Amazon built their business model virtually, right? Mm-hmm. And then now what they're doing is that they're transitioning into the brick and mortar business, right? Yeah. So they brought Whole Foods right. for, I think, $12 billion a few years ago. Then they have a bookstore. They have Amazon Bookstore. And mm-hmm. now they actually... Amazon Go. You heard of that? Yeah. So Amazon Go is a cash li- a cashierless grocery store that I think is in the UK. And that's like their new uh, forte into, into grocery stores where no cashiers, everything is virtual. So what they're actually doing is they're combining, right? So they, they're combining their virtual dominance with the physical dominance as well. And with Amazon, what they're really trying to do is that they're trying to actually corner the market in every way that you could possibly shop. Because everybody knows that they have the online game on Smash, right? Yeah. So now they have Amazon Echo. So Amazon Echo, if anybody's not familiar, that's like Alexa, where it's like a voice thing. That voice you, activated. You, yeah, voice activated thing you speak to. You can give orders and you can order stuff via that way. Yeah. Then they have Dash Button. A lot of people don't even know what Dash Button is. Dash Button is only for Amazon Prime members. It's, it's The best way I can describe it is like a USB with a button on it, right? And they ship it to you with items that you buy a lot of. So if you buy a lot of Pop-Tarts, then you'll get a dash button with your Pop-Tarts. And when your Pop-Tarts is running low, when your Pop-Tarts runs up, you just hit the dash button and more Pop-Tarts get get sent to you. Two days. Yeah, so it's the same thing, (laughs) cereal, anything that you can think of. So you don't even have to go online, you don't have to give a voice, all you have to do is just literally press a button. Now, and then they have the physical store. So they really, those four things combined, they're going to corner the market with any way that a person could actually shop. Yeah. They're going to be involved. And then also they want to move into fashion. And that's an interesting... And cosmetics as well. Yes, yeah. cosmetic as well. So people still like to feel the fabric and still try things on, even though a lot of times people shop online. Yeah. Me personally, I do both. So with Amazon moving into the physical locations, that's going to help them out with fashion as yeah. well. They said that you can, uh, they can send you the clothes, you can try them on, and if you don't like them, send it back, I believe. I think they have that as part of their, okay. their business now. That makes sense. I mean, yeah. that's like most online yeah. shopping. Yeah, I mean, that's dope, though. Yeah. Man. Yeah, you don't have to leave your home to do it. So, and then also, what I like to do personally, I order stuff online that from a store that I know I can bring it back to if it doesn't fit. Right. So, if it doesn't fit, then I can just bring it back to the physical location as opposed to having to go through the hassle of bringing it to the... So, I think that there's 
there is still room for brick and mortar, right? Mm-hmm. And you're going to talk about an interesting story that a brick and mortar company that yeah. has actually got it right. Yeah, they got it right. And they're actually like a case study um, in the Wall Street Journal. But um, a couple of the ones that didn't work, you said, were like Macy's is closing store, Jay Z's Penny's closing store, Kmart. But TJ Maxx has actually gotten it right. Um, so TJ Maxx, they, all, they own a few companies. They own Marshalls and they own Home Goods. And they rely solely on brick and mortar, right? So their stores, I think they have about 3,800 stores. They rely, all their revenue pretty much comes from that. They don't really do too much online um, advertising or trying to build their site. And when we see stores closing, they're saying no. They've seen uh, for 33 straight quarters up until 2018, I believe, where they, their profits has increased. So 33 straight quarters, they're seeing people coming in their stores, shopping, buying things. And if you've shopped at TJ Maxx or Monstros, you know that you're getting discounted prices on brands, high-end brands at discounted prices. But the brilliant strategy that they use is they turn it into a shopping hunt. It's like you go into these stores and it's like, hey, I found a bargain here. Whereas, <laughs> right? Whereas in like stores like JCPenney's, it's like, hey, this is the polo section. This is the Nike section. This is Tommy Hilfiger section. TJ Maxx is like, you know what? We're going to call this activewear and we're going to put all those brands there and you go hunt for the deal. So sometimes you'll find things in there that's like, oh, this is 60% off. All right. That's a bargain. Now, if I buy it and you go and you might not find it because it's like, that's the point of the sca- scavenger hunt. It's like, all right, well, I got it. Now you got to wait. The other thing that they do is they reinvent their inventory. They get new inventory like every 21 days. So like stores like Macy's and JCPenney, they don't have that type of turnover. So TJ Maxx is like, their inventory is coming in. It's limited. People know that they're going to get a bargain there. They get it. 21 days later, it's gone. All of it. And then they get more in, right? So like their sales have exceeded Nordstrom and JCPenney's combined. TJ Maxx, nobody's even thinking about that. Right. Right. So like that's key. So if, if it's, if it's dead, then how is this thriving? They've got it right. TJ Maxx, you know what I was always thinking about TJ Maxx when I was young, they pioneered the layaway. System, remember that? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you, I don't know if you, I don't know if you did that, but I did that before. I did that on the when TV I was a from, kid from Kmart. I did that on clothes. To when TJ Maxx, yes, they had a layaway system where you can put clothes on layaway. Yeah, I don't they still do that? I don't know, but uh, yeah, that's how important fashion was. <laughs> yeah, as a kid. Yeah, so we, so there, there are some other companies that have that model of like we'll bring a bunch of brands into a store like. A Sims, which is out of business, and finally his basement, they're out of business. And if you look at that, their strategy, they, they, their stores were so big and everything was everywhere. Whereas in TJ Maxx, you can look up, all right, that's the women's section, that's the men's section, this is kids, active wear. It's very concentrated and it, it's easy to find the things. Um, so, like, like I said, they're succeeding. Yeah, that's one of the problems, especially like with Sears, yeah. is that it's hard to be a master of all trades, right? So, you go into Sears, you can buy tires. You can buy swimming wear. Right. You can buy, and, and there's, there's nobody to help you. You gotta try and figure it out on your own, and it becomes difficult. Yeah, man. It becomes very difficult. Yeah, so like that, that strategy, like, and like I said, that's an article. Like, they're trying to figure out how are they doing this, right? If Brick and Mart is dead, then how is TJ Maxx thriving? So TJ Maxx is thriving, and I wanted to bring it closer to. Cause we try to relate to the everyday people, right? Mm-hmm. And brick and mortar. So there's three types of brick and mortar businesses that most entrepreneurs that's just getting started, especially, you know, in our community, they always want to start, right? And that is a restaurant. I knew he was going to say that. That's a hair salon <laughs> or barbershop. Yep. And a clothing store. Mm-hmm. Sounds pretty, about right. Pretty common, right? Sounds about right. So, all right. We've all seen... How barbershops and hair salons are cash cows. Yeah. Right. Especially hair salons. We yeah. have to do a whole thing about that. But the, that's a billion dollars. Yeah. That's a, like personally, I know that. No, especially <laughs> black women's hair. Oof. That is a billion dollar industry. We should have an episode on that. And that's a fact. Yeah. Um, and barbershops, a long staple in the community. Restaurants, one of the hardest businesses to succeed in. We're going to have, we got a, a special situation about the restaurant. Yeah. But, um, Everybody, for some reason, they still want to open restaurants. I don't know why. But you see one restaurant succeed, you see 100 fail. Mm -hmm. And then the clothing store, right? So clothing store. So I'm going to tell a personal story about the clothing store. So people that don't know, I'm a financial advisor. That's what I do for a living, right? So I had a young lady come into my office a few months ago. 
And she's a social media influencer. I won't say her name, but she's a social media influencer. She's real big on social media. She has around, like, let's say 2.5 million followers on Instagram. So she comes to me and she's having problems with her business, right? So we're talking about the business and I'm getting the information. We're going over the numbers and she's bleeding money on her clothing store. She has a clothing store, Mm -hmm. right? So she has a clothing store in the suburbs of New York. And she's paying $12,000 a month in rent in a, in a mall. And her overhead, she has, you know, overhead about total, probably $20,000 a month, right? And I'm telling her, like, well, why don't you just do it online? And she was saying how online she used to make like $8,000 a month online, yeah. right? Before she actually had the store. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. So I'm like, okay, you have 2.5 million followers on Instagram, right? Now, New York is probably your biggest market because you're from New York, Mm -hmm. but your store is not even in the city. It's in the suburbs, right? So probably, let's say 2% of your followers can actually go to your physical location, right? So you're not leveraging your social media power, right? right? Why don't you have an online presence where any follower... No matter where they live, whether it's Germany, Australia, California, Connecticut, they can shop online 24 hours a day, right? You have a physical location. You're already limiting yourself right. geographically. That's what we right? said. Like, that's episode one. Can the consumer get the product? Well, yeah, exactly. That's the biggest thing. Can the consumer get the product? So yeah. you're already limiting yourself geographically, yeah. right? Now, not only are you limiting yourself geographically, you're spending a ton of money on overhead, right? And that's the problem with brick and mortar. So this is the real problem with brick and mortar is that... The money that is being spent on overhead, you're not bringing enough revenue in. So now you have to see if it really makes sense. And this is why a lot of restaurants, this is why most businesses fail regardless. But it's harder for brick and mortar businesses because now you have to pay your rent every month regardless. You got to pay your cable bill, your light bill. You got to pay your employees every month, whether you make money or not. Right. So you have a good month. Okay. If you have a bad month, nobody wants to hear. You still got to pay. Right. Where you have an online business, you have expenses, but nowhere near the brick and mortar. So especially for something like clothes, we look at Fashion Nova. We talked about Fashion Nova before. Yeah. But I don't I personally don't see how it makes sense for a brick and mortar fashion business to to, to succeed. Not to say yeah. that it can't succeed, but it would have to be really tied in with an online presence yeah. and just have like a flagship store. Like Fashion Nova has like four stores, yeah. but those are more like flagship stores, right? I don't personally see how it makes sense to have a brick and mortar as your sole only store yeah. for something like fashion. So, so so what we're seeing now is that people are starting online, like these small businesses. They start online and when they generate enough revenue, then they'll create a store, a brick and mortar store because it's like, all right, now, and this is one of the keys that people are trying to adapt to is like, we have to create an experience for these customers for them to come. So, like, yeah, that, that young lady might have that store in New York, but if they're having experiences in that store that they can only get there, then people might fly well, to come. Yeah, you gotta have something special, have right? Something. Like there's there's a, a donut shop in, in New York and it's called it's Cronuts actually, which yeah. is a combination between croissants and donuts. Exactly. And long story short, people wait on online at like five o'clock in the morning, they only sell like a hundred per day, it's limited. You gotta have some kind of gimmick, something right. like that. So people but, are coming from all over. Oh, but you also have to combine. Like, even if we look at the restaurant business, right? So now Uber Eats is killing it, right? So now you have a physical location where you're making food, but people can still go on the app and order it. And now you have a delivery service that's delivering them food as well. Right. And even if you look at the meal prep business, that's huge as far as even mailing people um, food. Like, So you, I think in order to survive in today's climate, you have to, at the very least, combine both. Yeah. You can't just be brick and mortar. Yeah, adapt and adjust. You have to adapt and adjust, but I don't think brick and mortar is totally dead, but I think in some industries, it just doesn't make sense, in my opinion. If we look at the number one company in the world, Apple, they keep building stores. So it's like, you know what I mean? Like this this isn't going anywhere. And Apple has a unique model, right? They have this this customer, when they hire employees, they have this model, they live by the acronym A-P-P-L-E. So what that means is like the first A is number one, we have to approach the customer. So if you've ever walked into an Apple store, you'll notice that there's a lot of employees in there. So there's enough for everybody to have a one-on-one relationship with the with the employee. The second thing is that they probe. So they'll listen. Hey, why are you here today? Can we help you with something? The next thing is present. After they hear what you come to the store for, then they'll say, all right, well, here are some things that can help you. Here's a product that can help what you're trying to do. The next thing they do is they listen, right? They listen to say, all right, well, 
you've told me the problem. I've given you a solution. What do you think about it? Right. Usually people buy the product or they'll say, you know what, I'll come back. And then that leads to the E. It's like the end. Hey, thank you for coming. I, I'd love to see you come back. And a lot of times Apple customers are loyal. They'll come back just because of the customer service. And while they wait, which is unique to Apple, they can use the products. Like how many times do you go into stores and kids are, or adults are using the products while they're waiting or they're taking a class at the store while they're waiting? So you got to have these in-store experiences that are unique to your store to generate the customers. So it doesn't matter like if you have a great online presence, you can't get this experience anywhere else but coming to the store. That's pretty powerful. That acronym is pretty powerful for any business owner. Yeah. But uh, yeah, well, brick and mortar business, as I said, uh, you know, I think that it's not dead, but you have to find a way to combine the two if you want to survive. And yeah. this is what this show is about. We want to teach entrepreneurship and help you out, help your business out. So yeah. yeah. Last note, like we had, a, we spoke about Tesla. Tesla, one of the store, they completely did away with all their stores, right? And we said that Payless is closing stores, has closed, Gymboree has closed, Charlotte, a lot of stores have closed. Because they couldn't adapt. Pay, pay less is one of those that just didn't adapt. Online experience was terrible. They were still relying on print ad. They couldn't adapt. So you saw what happened to them. Yeah. Well, it's a jungle out here. Got to survive. All right, ladies and gentlemen. It's our favorite time of the episode. Story time. All right, boys and girls. So we are going to tell a story. If you follow the, the show, you know that this is my favorite part of the show every time. Uh, the last segment is story time. And today we have a very special story, very interesting story. Yeah. And we're going to talk about the best sports deal ever made. They said that when you say the word interesting, that means it's about to get real. Yeah, that's a fact. <laughs> it's about that's to get real. So this, this is the best sports deal ever made in history, in history of sports, right? So in the 1970s, there was a league called the ABA. Yeah, the American Basketball Association. Right. So there was the NBA, which everybody knows about the NBA, right? But then there was the ABA. So the best way I can really describe the ABA, if anybody's a football fan, remember the, the AFL? Yeah. So Even now the XFL. Right. Yeah. But the AFL was pretty big at one point. They had Herschel Walker, I think. Yeah, yeah, in the 80s. Yep, yeah, yep, yep, yep. So the AFL was a was a football league in the 80s, and they was just wild. Like, they had the cheerleaders just it, – it, it was – the whole vibe was just like – Yeah, they wanted to be everything the NFL wanted. Yeah, it was just more – it was you know, renegade. You know what would be better? Like, WWF and WCW. Okay. You know what I mean? That was for the kids. Similar, similar. Yeah, very so, similar. So the ABA was like – the NBA at the time was kind of boring. Uh, it was like the Celtics, you know, just – Blue collar, you know, it's just kind of boring. Yeah. When the ABA, they had the striped basketball, they had the cheerleaders, they had the Duncan, and they had good players too. They had great players. They had Dr. J. Yeah. They had Moses Malone. uh, David Thompson. David Thompson. So they had like- George Gervin. George Gervin, Iceman. Yeah. So the ABA was just like, it was like street ball. That's the the, the, the comparison. ABA ABA was like the N1 street ball, like the Rucker, stuff like that. The All-Star game, like that comes from the NBA. All the festivities. The All-Star game, all that. The dunk contest. Yeah. That was ABA. Exactly. So ABA was, they was was for excitement, right? But financially, it just wasn't working out for them, right? So what happened is that there was seven teams in the ABA, and the NBA wanted to merge, mm-hmm. right? Because it, it was just – didn't make sense to just kind of compete with them, and the ABA was kind of on their last leg financially. Yeah. So the NBA went to them, and they proposed a merger, mm-hmm. right? So the merger – the ABA accepted the merger, and it was seven teams at the time. Right. So four teams – were brought into the NBA. Those yeah. four teams were the Nets, the Nuggets, the Pacers, and the Spurs, mm-hmm. which are still in the NBA today, right? Yeah. And then, so there was three more teams left. So one team, Virginia, they uh they actually fizzled out and they didn't they didn't get brought in because they just didn't make it, right? Yeah. They bellied up. So that that left two teams, mm-hmm. right? So you had Kentucky, the team from Kentucky, Kentucky, I think Colonels, the Kentucky Colonels. So you know, you know what's crazy about them? The crazy thing about them is that they were owned by the owner of Kentucky Fried Chicken. Yes. Which is crazy. John Brown. Yeah. So the NBA buys him out for $3 million at the time, 1976. It's like, that's a lot of money. But it's like that's a side business for me. Like, I got Kentucky Fried Chicken. So he takes the deal. And he also uh, was the only, he became the governor of Kentucky. Yeah, governor of Kentucky too. Yeah. It's all right. So they had the Kentucky Colonels and the St. Louis Squires. Spirits. Spirits. St. Yeah. Louis Spirits. Yeah. So, they offered the Kentucky team and the St. Louis team $3 million 
as a buyout. Yeah. Kentucky takes it, right? <laughs> right? St. Louis says not so fast. Yeah. We, 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 not interested. Yeah. Not interested. Well, the, the, they said no because they had, had the vision. They were like, look. Well, we, before we even go to that, before we go right. to that. So they said no, right? But they had good talent. Yeah, yeah. They had Moses Malone, a few other players, right? Yeah. That, I think that was his rookie year, 1976. He's the first man child. Like yeah. the first man He's the child. first person to come from high, high school. school. Right, he's the first man to, child. To professional. Yeah. Right. So so they rejected it, right? And the owners of the team, they had, it was two brothers, mm-hmm. Ozzy and Dan. And um, what's the last name? Silna. Silna. The Silna Brothers. Osney and Dan Silna. So what they negotiated was a $2 million buyout and a part of the four teams that were going into the NBA, TV rights. All right. So they got one-seventh of the TV rights of those four teams that went to the NBA, mm-hmm. right? So at the time... TV wasn't really big. It was like black and white, the things with the wire and <laughs> nah, stuff like not that. that far back. We, they was nah, color. The 70s. They had color in the 70s. All right, well, barely. <laughs> but nobody was, making mo- nobody was making money on TV. No, not right? yet. Not yet. So they say, okay, one-seventh of four teams, TV rights, wh- uh, whatever. Well, like they were so it. eager to get the deal done. NBA just wanted to get the deal done, right? So they said, okay, whatever. Give them two million and give them one-seventh and... Let it, you know, yeah. let them go on their way. Yeah. At that time, I think the biggest star in the NBA, you have Oscar Robinson, uh, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and uh, Dr. J is right there on that line of becoming superstar. Bill Russell probably is one of the biggest stars too. Yeah. Not Bill Russell, Bill uh, Walton. Bill Walton. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. So, all right. So now, this is 1976? 76. 1976. So... A few years pass, and the 80s come, and Larry Bird and Magic Johnson come into the league, right? Yeah. And the NBA changes forever, right? <laughs> yeah. And then a few years after Larry Bird and Magic Johnson come into the league- There's this guy. Michael Jordan. Michael Jeffrey Jordan. And then the league changes even more forever, yeah, right? As far as, as, yeah, obviously the landscape and now TV. So now television- Television comes into play, right? And you have a network called ESPN, and now sports is just American television staple, yeah. right? Everybody watches sports on TV now in the eighties, nineties. So now, what happened? As nobody would ever watch sports on TV, let's just give these yeah. guys one seventh. They ended up as the league grew, so the league grew to thirty teams, right? Yeah. So their TV revenue, those the two brothers, equal two percent. Of the total TV revenue right. for the NBA, right. right? Right. So every year, they got two percent of TV revenue in perpetuity. That was the best part of the deal. Yeah. It was in perpetuity. It was no end date. It's yeah. forever. They Perp- start- so you want to just tell them what perpetuity is? Some people it, don't even know. Yeah, perpetuity means forever. <laughs> Continuous. That's the easy answer. That's the quick <laughs> Continuous. That's cash the quick flow. answer. So, yeah. so so now they have two percent of all NBA TV revenue forever, Oof. right? So. This thing is one of the most embarrassing things that the NBA has ever dealt with, right? Mm-hmm. Because they end up paying these guys three hundred million dollars, right? From the from, from 19, the started from from nineteen seventy six to yeah. two thousand fourteen. The, the crazy part is that for from seventy six to seventy nine, they didn't make a dollar, but from eighty to ninety seven, or eighty to like two thousand, it's the two thousand three hundred million. Three hundred million. Two thousand fourteen, it, it was three hundred million, right? Mm-hmm. So finally, 2014, the NBA, they're going to re-up on the TV deal, right? Right. So like they're about to, they had a few uh, TV deals prior. They had one with NBC um, and then they had one with ESPN. And like you, like you said, sports were built over that. Like that's a 24-7 sports network. So you could imagine like people are going to be consuming sports at an all-time high. But in 2014, they re up with uh, Turner Sports and ESPN, a nine-year deal. For $24 billion. Right. So right before they do that, they say, okay, we have to get away from this deal because we've been bleeding money for 30 years and it's only going to get worse as we continue to grow. And now they see that, okay, the TV deals is going to keep getting bigger and bigger, right? Right. And we're not going to keep paying these guys 2% forever, right? (laughs) So we got to get away from this. So they agree on a deal in 2014 for a lump sum buyout of $500 million, right? So now you add the three hundred million that they got up into two thousand fourteen. Add that number up. You add the five hundred million. So they got eight hundred million dollars. They got eight hundred million dollars on a three million dollar deal. Yeah. Three million dollar buyout originally that they turned down, 
They ended up getting eight hundred million. The NBA didn't even have to have this problem. They didn't even have to. Like they wanted to buy teams. They wanted to buy Detroit in the late seventies. They wanted to buy uh, the Jersey Nets at that time in the nineties. They would have had been owners at in two thousand two. Uh, 2010, they had accumulated almost 300 million. They were worth more than the Indiana Pacers were. No, but the best part about the story is that so they make 800 million dollars from the NBA without any overhead. <laughs> no, a team that nobody's heard of, a phantom team that nobody's heard of. Straight profit. No, no players, no roster, no overhead, no building, nothing. They literally made almost a billion dollars. Just cause. Chilling, yeah. Hang Just cause. Cause. Yeah. Forever. So many people say, okay, well, why did they take the buyout? They could have just kept this going forever, right? So the guy, one of the guys died, rest in peace, a couple yeah. years ago. So I think, you know, he probably gets to a point where it's like, okay, I'm about to die soon. So I might as well just get yeah. 500 million up think, front. That's like, enough for my family. in the late 70s. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. all right. And then also, it was a headache for them because they hired lawyers. They kept going back and forth because they felt like the NBA was kind of cheating them with the numbers mm-hmm. and it wasn't correct. So they, that was kind of, and then, their name was always associated with that. And they didn't really want to be associated with that forever. I wouldn't mind. <laughs> yeah, it's not a bad problem. They kind of wanted to just get it over with. Uh, but in life, there's ups and downs, right? So they make almost $800 billion doing nothing. But then they lose a substantial amount of money. Yeah. They, from they, they connect with this the guy. Notorious. The notorious. notorious one, Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff. Yeah. Bernie Madoff. So Bernie Madoff burns him pretty bad. Yeah, man. <laughs> Bernie Madoff burns it pretty bad. And they lose a lot of money with Bernie Madoff. Yeah, they said, thank God they didn't lose it all because they were they had diversified their portfolio, yeah. which is good. Um, but they did lose a substantial amount with Bernie. They lost a lot. Yeah. What are you doing, 250, 250 years? Uh, yeah, he's doing a lot. He's doing a lot of time. Yeah. Bernie Madoff plays a part in Mets as well. Yeah, the Wilpon family lost a lot of money. We'll, with talk, about some, we'll talk about that sometime. Yeah. But, so, yeah. So, but hey, they won. Even though they lost a lot of money with Bernie Madoff, they still won yeah. in, the, in the grand scheme of things. And it's a good story. And how we bring it back to the everyday person is that we always talk about equity, right? And the power of equity and the power of delayed gratification, not taking everything up front. Mm-hmm. So they still got $2 million up front. But that TV deal that they struck was mm-hmm. brilliant, right? It ended up netting them almost a billion dollars. So the guy from KFC, I mean... He's filthy rich. I, I'm sure, you know, it's not the end of the world. For him. But he has to be kicking himself or his family. I mean, you took $3 million and you, the other guys. How about the owners of the Virginia Squires? <laughs> like, they left before they could even get the two, the three million, the, the $2 million offer to be bought out, man. They were the owners. No, the Virginia Squires. Oh, Virginia yeah, Squires. They folded before they can get the deal. They folded. Yeah. It wasn't their fault. They folded. Yeah. Well, all right. Well... Before we end, we want to talk about a few initiatives that we're starting. Yeah. So um, we talk about Patreon uh, a lot, but I don't think you guys fully understand. So we want to kind of give you the backstory yeah. on it. So me and Troy, we have a financial literacy program that we run in the summertime. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where we help kids learn about finance and mm-hmm. stocks and stuff like that. And then also, we try, we're try trying to take the financial literacy program like nationwide. Yeah. And also, we want to write a book about financial literacy as well. And then also... Just kind of spread the word of, you know, outside of the podcast of financial literacy, go to different towns, cities, you know, workshops, stuff yeah. like that. Because, you know, good thing about the internet now is that we have a global reach, but we want to reach the people in person and help as many people as we possibly can, right? That's yeah, our that's goal, the goal, to help. The goal yeah. is to help. Um, so, obviously, you know, finances are important when it comes to helping. So, Patreon is, is, is an avenue that we put together to kind of help financially fund these different initiatives that we have, right? Yeah. And also, we are putting together a goal, right? So, our goal is to have 100 people. 100 um, patrons. 100 patrons. And our ultimate goal is 1,000, but we want to break it up into smaller goals. Mm -hmm. So, 100 patrons. And there's different levels of our Patreon, right? So, the Patreon, like Rashad said, it's it's for creators. And I know some people... Are not familiar with it, but it's for creators and it's to help fund some of their, their initiatives and their plans. And so what we're doing, uh, is once we reach a hundred patrons, we're going to, uh, reach out to five of them and have them talk to us for an hour, or have the ability to talk to us for an hour so they can pick our brain. A lot of times on the Earn Your Leisure page and your, your page, people want you to mentor them or can they pick your brain? So this is that opportunity. So after we get to a hundred, we're going to take five of those people and we're going to reach out and we're going to have those conversations. 
um, because it's important. And it, it, when you go there, you'll see that there's different tiers. We have five tiers. So you, you can join at any tier that you like. Um, but yeah, just to help to support and help us get out some of these visions that we have. We, we've created that avenue. Yep. So that's on the uh, website, earnyourleisure.com. And then also on the website is our merch that me and Troy are wearing. If you're uh, subscribed to our YouTube, which subscribe to our YouTube, <laughs> Earn Your Leisure is the YouTube page. You see we have the, I have my shirt, which is Hustle for Your Last Name. Troy has the Assets, assets Over Liability. Liability and that is on our merch we have new merch that we rolled out as well. So, yeah, yeah. yeah People are sure. asking for colors. So, we got every color. Uh, we got every color. We, we got, got, a, we got the, uh, dad hats. the V-neck for the ladies. Yeah, we got we got a full we got a full array of things. And then also, the book. But before, before I leave. So, uh, so, I promised you every episode I'm going to mention a book that I think is good for business. Uh, or just, you know, just in general. So, Phil Knight, Shoe Dog. Is an interesting book. I recommend anybody that's interested in business Nike. For anybody that's not familiar, Phil Knight is the owner or well, the, the CEO. I don't know if he's still CEO, but he started Nike. Yeah. The founder of Nike, right? So he tells the story of Nike and it's his story and it's how Nike, and it's for any entrepreneur because there's no easy path to entrepreneurship. And it talks about a lot of the ups and downs and different battles that he took. So I highly recommend that book. Uh, Phil Knight, shoe dog. Yeah. So like like the final message, I'll give that out, man, is struggle, another sign that God loves you. So like that's part of the stories too. Perseverance, preparation, man. You got to keep following your dream, never be discouraged, um, and don't take immediate gratification like we, we told in the story, man. Sometimes delayed gratification has its benefits. So that's my final word. Yeah. So that's it. Peace. Peace.